always ask my staff, sometimes they get here before I do, and I always say, how big's the podium? <laughs> because uh, and a lot of folks will ask me, you do a lot of public speaking. Do you get nervous? And I said, the only thing that makes me nervous is wondering how high the podium is before I get there. But we're good. So can you see me? Okay. So I think this mic is going in and out, but um, you might hear every other word. So let me know if we're doing okay. Um, I am honored to serve as a district director for the SBA's lower Rio Grande Valley district. Um, this particular district covers 14 counties. So we're as far south as Cameron, as far north as Aransas, and as far west as Zapata County. So we have a large area that we cover. And also, as, uh, as Ron said, I am also covering San Antonio right now. So, and they have another 55 counties. Um, in this particular 14 counties, we have almost 200,000 uh, small business firms. And those small business firms include franchises, right? And um, so today we're kind of joined uh, by a common mission, and that mission is to help start, manage, grow, and expand small businesses. And the franchising um, model or business model is, is prime for this. Um, I was just talking to them thinking, you know, I'm gonna probably retire in the next few years, and I think, Maybe I should open a franchise. <laughs> um, so why, why do you think, uh, how many in here are familiar with franchising? Are you ready to hear about franchising from the experts? So franchising offers a unique blend of, of autonomy and support under an umbrella of, established, um, of an established brand, like, you know, McDonald's, Dairy Queen, Holiday Inn, and those types of things. It represents sort of a symbolic relationship between a franchisor um, who provide a, a proven business model and um, operational guidance and uh, brand recognition. The arrangement allows for an individual like you to embark on entrepreneurial ventures with reduced risk compared to just starting a business from scratch while leveraging the success and reputation of, of these well-known brands. Um, nonetheless, um, the journey to becoming a successful franchisee is multifaceted and demands careful, careful consideration on various factors. From selecting the right franchise partner, one that meets your mission and your life goals, um, to securing financing, which the SPA can help, uh, to navigating legal settlements or agreements, and also the big human capital. So those are all things that are, um, you know, challenging um, when you're trying to consider a franchise. And then after you are in the franchise, right, you have to... Once you're operational, you have to maintain the brand standards, right? You, you have to manage the day-to-day -day operations. And then you have to adapt to the evolving market dynamics um, for, their, for that particular chosen industry. So with that being said, um, I have to say that I am very grateful, uh, incredibly grateful, to have these extraordinary panelists of, of, of business people and franchisees with us today. Please note that their stories and knowledge and experiences are invaluable, and uh, we appreciate their willingness to share with us. So thank you. Let's give them some love. Thank you. All right. But real quick before I start, um, I just want to give some love or a big shout out to our table over there. I've got Josh Patton, who's a lender relations specialist. And so we encourage you to stop by our table and say hi to Josh and myself. Um, and, and, you know, we're there to support you 100% um, of the way. Um, just real quick about the SBA, and I'm just gonna throw this out there. I don't wanna waste our time talking about, um, cause I want you to hear from these folks, but I do have to tell you that the SBA does support franchises. We are your partner. Um, 
We will assist you in financial assistance, educational resources, and obviously mentor programs. Um, the SBA does equip franchises with the tools and the knowledge necessary to navigate the complexities of franchising and achieve their, your business goals, right? Uh, just a little, I'm just gonna throw out a couple of numbers uh, just so you know that the SBA is committed. Um, an example is when I talk to you about the 14 counties, right, in the lower Rio Grande Valley District, we just in the last 18 months have guaranteed uh, 37 uh, franchise uh, loans, right? And this total is $29.2 million, .29 million, and that's in the past 18 months. So this particular district has done 37 franchises. But more interesting um, is 73% of those guaranteed loans to franchises were in the four counties of the Rio Grande Valley. And that has injected 21.3 million and created 348 jobs. So congratulations to our franchisees. I know we have, yeah. Yeah. So again, SBA is, is here to support you. Um, whether you're a, you know, a franchise or not, we're still gonna support you. Now, um, I'm gonna introduce our three panelists and then I'm gonna ask them to introduce themselves and just give us a brief synopsis of uh, your franchise, okay? And I, I promised her I would not chop her name up. So her, uh, we have Viviana. Did I do it? Yay! Uh, Trevino, she's the owner of Buzzed Bull Creamery. We have Robert Bob Lozano. He's the owner of Dairy Cream franchises and then a whole bunch of other ones, I think, when we spoke on the phone. And then we have Nitten. Did I say that right? Okay, Kassan. Kason? Kassan? Ocean Gate Hotels and Development Company with us today. So can we give them a hand, please? All right. I'm gonna, let's do ladies first. So real quickly, just tell us um, about your franchise, where it's located, um, and just a little, like a one minute at the mic time thing. I'll keep it short and simple. Um, I'm probably the less experienced of us three here. Um, my name is Viridiana Trevino. I am the franchise owner of the Westlaco location of Buzzbo Creamery, and we're actually located here, downtown Westlaco. Um, the, the brand itself, the, the company is um, only one in Texas currently. Uh, it originated out of Ohio. So um, there's many, Cincinnati, Mainville, it's uh, spread out to Florida, Arizona, North, South Carolina. But in Texas, it's pretty brand new. So our goal is obviously to make it known, uh, make it expand as well. Um, and what we specialize in is ice cream. Um, so very similar to Mr. Lozano's concept, um, but it's a little bit different in the sense that um, we also have alcohol infused ice cream for those who are over 21 and like a little buzz to go with their ice cream, that's also an option. Um, so the, the, the thing about the brand is that um, they cater to all. They cater to adults, they cater to children, um, and everything is made fresh and homemade. Um, another big component of it is that we do use liquid nitrogen, so it's kind of an, an experience as well as, as you enjoy your ice cream. But that's a little bit about it. As far as myself, this is my first venture into franchising. Uh, prior to that, I've had um, the opportunity to manage and, and have um, small businesses, but as far as franchising, um, this is the first one, and it's, it's a, it takes a great deal to get there, but once it becomes operational, it's very rewarding. So. Thank you, Viriana. That's amazing. Uh, can we give her another round of applause? She just said she started her own franchise four months ago. That's a big jump. Um, it's, a, it's a tremendous feat. You should feel really proud, and you should get ready to work hard for a long time. <laughs> Uh, my name is Bob Lozano. Um, F&P Brands stands for Food and People. Uh, we currently operate Dairy Queen, Schlotsky, Cinnabon, um, and uh, manage and own most of our real estate as well. Uh, proud to be part of a family-owned business. Um, our family has been operating in the Rio Grande Valley for 38 plus years. Um, myself, um, I'm the CEO of F&P Brands, and uh, along with uh, my father, Robert, uh, who sits in an advisory position now, um, we... Um, 
we try to do our best every day, right? So I think I'm gonna ask Angela to go everywhere with me so she can introduce me, because most people say, oh, that's the ice cream guy, and not, not all the accolades you gave us. So thank you for that, Angela. And um, yeah, that's a little bit about us. Um, I, I um, look forward to, to answering some questions and try to give you everything we know. Um, it's a competitive environment out there. Um, it's not easy. Um, this business is not easy. Business in general is not easy. And I think it's really important that we rally as a community um, to share all ideas, uh, seek input, ask questions, and uh, hide nothing so that we can uh, rise as a community here in the Rio Grande Valley. So glad to be here. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is uh, Nitin Kassan. I'm at Ocean Gate Investments. Uh, I'm a second generation hotelier. Uh, we started off in Freer, Texas with an independent hotel, probably about 24 rooms. And now our family has uh, grown to about 30, 30 plus hotels. Uh, our last hotel that we've opened is in Houston downtown. And um, we're very involved in the Rugandi Valley. Uh, most of our assets are in the valley. And um, we represent Hilton, Marriott, IHE. And like Bob mentioned, you know, it's, uh, it's very competitive. Uh, you know, a lot of people think that uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not locally owned uh, hotels, but even though it's a brand, but you know, behind every Hampton, behind every Holiday Inn Express or, or what have you, there, there's a local owner there. So um, it's definitely a, a hard work and, 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 and community involvement there. Thank you. I, uh, during COVID, it, I talked to Nitin on the phone, and, and then this is the first time we meet. He says, I remember you. You helped me during COVID. <laughs> I was like, oh, nice to meet you. <laughs> I said, I hope I was nice to you. <laughs> okay, so we're going to start with the uh, panels, the, the questions. And I have a couple that I've picked out for all. Um, and so who wants to go first? Okay, all right. So here's your question, and this is gonna be for everybody so you can think about it. What factors influenced your decision to invest in a franchise rather than just starting your own business? Okay, that's a good question. <laughs> so um, like I had mentioned previously, in the past I did have the opportunity to, to um, have a small business. It was in the, in the restaurant industry, so I'm very familiar with what it takes uh, financially, structurally, time-wise um, in running a family-owned business. Uh, so this time around, when I had the opportunity to start something new, I knew that I wanted to be in the same industry, um, but I wanted to have uh, the building blocks and the foundation already kind of already set up so that I wouldn't have to start from the very beginning building the, the, the brand awareness, um, also, one of the biggest things about franchising is that they do provide all the assistance as far as from anything from providing purchasers, um, providing architects that um, are going to guide you with a specific plan. Uh, for this specific franchise, that was very important because we work with liquid nitrogen, so it's more based with cryogenics, which is not something very common in this area. So to have them be able to guide me and say, this is where you have to go and this is where you have to order this, um, <laughs> The, these uh, parts from, it just made it a lot easier and um, it, it was a lot faster process had I done it on my own. So I think that was definitely one of the biggest factors, the support that a franchise provides um, and also the, the timeline to be able to actually become operational. So would you say it was a turnkey, turnkey for you? Yes. Yeah, I would say that. Okay, you two gentlemen, who's going next? Can we repeat the question again? <laughs> <laughs> I was listening intently over here, I lost uh, focus. Okay, so what factors influenced your decision to invest in a franchise rather than just oh, got starting it, got your it. own business? Got it, uh, okay, well, um, hopefully we have an opportunity uh, you know, to share what we look for in franchises or new franchises, because I think that's vitally important. But I got to answer the question truthfully. I didn't. Um, I didn't have any factors. Uh, I didn't know any better. Um, I my family um, bled Dairy Queen red, and uh, <laughs> they were very proud to be Dairy Queen owners. And 
that uh, resonated with me. I wanted to be like dad. I wanted to, um, you know, grow and be a business owner. And I took that seriously and I took it to art. And uh, then I failed about 30 times after that. Um, I started my own business when I was 20, um, became a franchisee on my own um, uh, through a bankruptcy court. Um, and I, I, that's the honest truth on how I got into this. Um, today, our mindset, you know, 13 years later, how, how uh, might that have changed? Uh, yeah, we do look at our business differently and we do look at our franchises differently, but um, it started with passion. It started with um, loved ones that um, were passionate about the brand, which I think is very important because business doesn't happen without passion. Um, and uh, that's, that's, those were my factors as a young man. Now, I will say that uh, my folks didn't press anything upon me. Um, I was in the bar business for a while. I was in different restaurants for a while. I was um, you know, I cooked in a kitchen for a while, uh, love culinary, et cetera. Um, but ultimately I wanted to circle back around and, um, and, uh, grow the company with, uh, with my family. You want me to repeat the question? No, no, no. Okay. So, uh, I mean, why would you pick a franchise? It's in the hotel world, it's very difficult to get financing, um, uh, you know, with a independent property, uh, banks kind of you know, want to see a, a branded property. Um, so in, in my case, you, you, really, you really have to have a good, good selling point if you're going to do an independent hotel. Uh, Angela talks about the time I, I spoke to you when I, we purchased the, the Slitterbond Beach Resort back right before COVID in 2019. And uh, for about 12 months, we had it as an independent property. It was called the Beach, Beach Resort SPI. I think this gentleman knows that. He walked in whenever I bought the property and he was like, what are you doing? Buying a water park and converting it to a hotel. He thought I was crazy. And then uh, you know, I talked to the bank and we finally came to the conclusion of, of putting that as a Holiday Inn um, Beach Resort. So uh, I guess to go around that question, in, in, in my space, it kind of really has to be a, a branded hotel sometimes, uh, unfortunately. You I were crazy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're all crazy yeah. for trying to get into yeah. business, but we're going to do well. I have to hand it to you, though, uh, in talking to Nitin, he, in listening to his circumstance, I was feeling really bad. This guy is resilient, and his business is resilient. And um, I can't say it enough because I, he was in some pretty strange circumstances, very hurtful circumstances for a business owner. So um, I think we need to give him a, a round of applause for, <laughs> for, for hanging in there and making it happen because that, that's a nice property on the island and it's one of our, you know, things that we can enjoy in the community. So thank you. All right, so... A Angela asked me for a free room before this, so she... she <laughs> I did it. <laughs> hey, I'm a government employee. I have rules and ethics things I have to pay attention to, so... <laughs> stop outing me in front of everybody. <laughs> um, so... Just a quick... I mean, I think you kind of answered the question, but what motivated you to choose the properties that you're in? That would be a good question for Viviana. Um, I kind of understand why you guys would, yours is financing, but what motivated you to pick that particular franchise? Um, I think the biggest motivation is I wanted to bring something new to the area. Uh, this particular franchise is actually very not very common um, because it does come it's a combination of alcohol with ice cream um, liquid nitrogen so it was something completely new and when I started doing my research um, I found it and I found that it was extremely interesting something unknown to the valley to the area and that was my my biggest motivation as far as bringing it out here I, I just wanted something different and um did the franchise help you do like a market study? Because even because it is different, is it? Do they know, or can they help you, or assist you in understanding your market and if it will be successful in the market? 
Yes, so that was one of the biggest things. Um, the franchise itself is not very established. I mean, they've been around for about five, six years. So that was one of the biggest things, um, the market study. Uh, one of the, when we were looking into location, um, the, they wanted to send us to the McAllen, Edinburgh area, um, because they thought it would be better and better suited for, for that demography. Uh, but at the same time, um, that's one of the things that I looked on on my end. We have Dairy Queen. That's one of the, I believe, the highest, our Westlico location is the highest selling ice cream point in, in the whole area. Um, so obviously the demand is there and the opportunities are there. So I did my own market study. I showed them my, the numbers um, of as far as the demography. Um, another thing that they pointed out is that because we're so close to the border, a lot of our clients come from that area. You have a lot of Mexican nationals crossing over and um, spending their money over here, and there's not a way to track it because it's cash flow. The, yep. the, the, they pay with cash, so there's no, no way yep. to track that. So that's one of the other things that we pointed out. Um, and once they saw those numbers and they considered those factors, they felt, okay, yeah. um, this is something that is definitely doable. And then when they came down, then they visited the location and they actually see what Westlaco looks like and how our downtown area is thriving. That convinced them even more. So, I love that answer. Um, it reminds me, in my previous life, I was president of the Brownsville Chamber. And we would uh, entertain, you know, franchise or, or franchise companies or box companies that would come to the area. And one of them reminds me that, you know, they were like, according to your demographic um, and your median household income, we're gonna build a store this big. And I told them, oh no, you're gonna need to build a bigger store. And they're like, no, no, we have all these demographics down. Um, well, they ended up being uh, packed every day, lines, uh, out because they never take into account the tons of folks that come across the border every day. And, and that particular franchise, which it's not in existence anymore, um, they had the highest wine sales in the entire United States. So they never take into account our, our folks, on, our, our neighbors on the other side. Did you have something? Yeah, yeah, I wanted to add to the to the location question because I think it's really important that we understand that franchising is a partnership, right? So essentially, you're investing in leadership and investing in tools and resources of a proven business model, right? Um, or brand equity in in uh, a brand. But what I want to stress as as local business owners is that you are still a local business despite being a franchise. So when they give you the tools and they give you the demo study and they sit out of their office and corporate and there's a beautiful, you know, uh, coffee machine and they're telling you, hey, you can build 10 of these and you can do great and they paint up this great picture. You're right. I can, but I got to go get back home and figure out exactly where this site goes because you only know so much, right? The data only goes so far and you've got to pair that with being in the market and understanding where people are moving, right? And so when we look at our sites and our locations, I'll, I'll tell a quick little story real quick about um, our Brownsville uh, location where, um, you know, Robert on our team said, hey, we're building one there. And I said, okay, well, let's see how we do. Uh, we lost our butts for three years because it, the development just wasn't there, right? Then came what? SpaceX, right? So now we're, up 120% at that location. And so it's things like that where if we stay involved in our community and we learn about what we're doing in the communities that we can try to identify sites that may not be um, you know, looked at the same way a franchisor would look at. So I really think it's important that you pair that groundwork, that boots on the ground and drive your communities and drive your areas and then pair that with what the franchisor's healthy resources will tell you as well. So. Do you own the franchise in Los Fresnos? I do. You do? I know it. We don't operate it, but I know it. Oh, okay. Yeah. So every every time I talk to somebody like younger than me, which is way younger than me, um, I even hired a young lady at the, uh, the... My point is is that these franchises also create jobs for our students, our high school, our young folks. And um, I hired a young lady um, at the at the Brownsville Chamber who worked at the Los Fresnos um, Dairy Queen at the same time, and she was still in high schools. 
But every time I talk to somebody in Los Fresnos, they tell me they worked at the Dairy Queen. <laughs> so That's probably true. Yeah. A lot of people have a story in Dairy Queen. So thinking about that, you know, I mean, when you think about the jobs that are created for our folks in the area, I mean, it's just wonderful. Um, I was going to go to the, uh, your first question, uh, Bob, which you kind of already gave that advice, but do you have some additional advice um, as to some, some, some advice? Uh, what would you give, what advice would you give to someone that's looking at or purchasing a franchise? I like the marketing information. Yeah, um, thanks, Angela. Yeah, my advice would be, um, you know, assess the brand equity, right? Because essentially you're leveraging an established brand, right? And that's not to say anything negative about my counterpart here. She is in an emerging brand, in an emerging market where that might make sense and she might be the leader and cutting edge and I hope she has 10 locations next time she's up here. Um, the, when, when selecting it, so you wanna assess the brand equity and, and how much you can leverage that brand, right? Is it established? Has it had some turmoil? What's the perception of that brand, right? Um, and so I would tell, I would, I would ask you to really assess the brand and say how much weight does that carry? Because then you're gonna have to know how much work you're gonna have to do. And that's just the fact of the matter. If there's a recognized brand that's cutting edge and on social, you're probably gonna have a line out your door. Right, but if it's an unrecognized brand, then you know you're gonna have to do a little bit more educating. Uh, I have a good friend of mine here, Alec, uh, he's in franchising as well. He had to do a lot of educating about uh, hydration and about a new industry that was coming here, right? So you can kind of assess the brand. I'd also add that um, I think that you wanna be culturally aligned um, with the leadership team because if they're gonna be pushing down an agenda and they're gonna have expectations of you, which you signed your dotted, you know, signed on the dotted nine, uh, line and, and put your name on it then it's gotta resonate well with you, right? So you wanna be culturally aligned with the leadership and their plan and their agenda so that way you can come out here and work hard and feel good about it. Um, it I would also assess the leadership and, and know that you're investing in, um, in leadership teams, right? And, and company culture up at a franchise and I think that's really important. I'll share really quickly, you know, the Schlotsky's brand. Um, the reason we got into Schlotsky's is because it has deep ties in Texas and it's been around for um, 55 plus years. Um, I talked to the president for about three years. Uh, we looked at the brand for about 10 years. Uh, they went through all kinds of bankruptcies and all kinds of stuff and I said, man, this president is great. He's been here 10 years, going on 11 years, this is awesome. Signed on, signed on as a franchisee, and now I've had six brand presidents since then. Um, that's not to take anything away from Schlotzky, because I love the product, and we're building, uh, we're going to build six more, and, and God willing, you know, have a lot of success with it. But those are things that you have to be aware of, and those are real consequences that are going to affect your family and your dinner table, ultimately, when you're having a conversation with your child and you're stressed because there's a president change, right? Um, so invest in the leadership, understand the leadership, and look at that. And then uh, the probably the most important thing, um, which I'm sure uh, you, you all have done as well or your family has done, um, is talk to other franchisees. You know, you, you go ask them, you know, how you doing? Are you happy? Are you not happy? Because they might paint you up a great picture. And it sounds like I'm, I'm bashing franchisors. I'm not. It's a beautiful model. But you've got to stay realistic about this. And you've got to go talk to other franchisees and ask them, you know, hey, are you happy? Is it working for you? What's not working? What could I do better? And the, 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 you know, the proof is in the pudding and they'll tell you if, if they're happy or not. And if you go through 10 or 12 people that aren't very happy, you might, might second guess, well, I feel pretty good about this brand, but I don't know if I'm gonna be happy ultimately with it. So those are probably be my three things is, is, is that brand equity, the cultural alignment and leadership, and then talk to franchisees. Does anybody wanna to add to that? Okay. No? Okay. All right. So the next question is going to go to Nitin. Uh, Nitin. How do you say your name? Nitin. Okay. I was doing good. All right. Um, so this is going to you. How do you balance adhering to the franchise's guidelines and implementing your ideas or innovations? Communication is key with the franchise, right? A lot of people are sometimes scared to communicate with their franchise leaders, and um, they depend on us to understand the local market. And um, I'll give you an example. In Laredo, uh, we started 
we have a Spring Hill Suites in Laredo, and uh, the brand wanted us to do a breakfast program that they rolled out, and we said we want tamales on our uh, breakfast uh, program, and they are confused what a tamale is. <laughs> so, uh, so you know, we had to educate them of you know where Laredo is, where's you know where we are, what are our clientele, who's our clientele and why are our breakfast scores so low? Uh, and now since we got tamales, our breakfast scores are high. So they're trying to put tamales in New York, and I'm like, that's not gonna work, man. Not, <laughs> they're, gonna, they're gonna freak out. So, 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 so I guess, you know, communication's key. Uh, and, and, and again, don't be scared to negotiate with your franchise, or, I mean, it's Marriott at the end of the day, but I mean, it, our scores are, are high and the tamales are hot and the tacos are ready and you know it's you, you gotta you gotta talk to your franchisor very good does anyone want to expand on that no I, I just he hit it on the money I mean negotiate with with your franchisor it's a partnership and now you know uh, you got to kind of know how much leverage you have right but I'm sure you went through a negotiation process and you asked I mean you got to protect your livelihood and and trust in them empower the brand and believe in the brand you're going to be a partner but negotiate the heck out of every single thing on that document yeah go ahead um like they mentioned it's a lot of um getting to know your lo your demography um because a lot of these franchises are not um, based here locally and like for example i can tell you from personal experience ours is ohio um, and one of the things that we noticed that they brought into or that's on the menu is cookie dough. So for us, yes, we have cookie dough um, in, in your ice cream, but not as as a serving. So they had like a, a one scoop, two scoop cookie doughs. And I was when I looked at that, I was like, well, who, who orders that? And not once have I ever had an order. So those are things that you kind of have to kind of negotiate, um, get to know your local demography, because if not, that can that could actually ultimately set you up for success or failure. If you don't connect with your local demography based on what the franchise is, is telling you to do, um, then it's not going to drive your sales. So it's, it's that communication like Nitin mentioned and also those no negotiations to kind of figure out what's going to work for you locally as well. Yeah. Is it sort of like trying to color outside of the lines without coloring outside of the lines? Yeah. Uh -huh. That sounds like me when I started with the federal government. I was like, yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. We've got to create these partnerships. And they're like, oh, we can't do those things. So then you just find ways around coloring outside the line. But staying within the lines, right? Hey, well, I'm, I'm going to just, I mean, I, uh, my team loves me and hates me for this. But I just keep it real and just tell you how it is. The franchisors and the people up there, most of them have a job. And most of them have to do everything to protect their job. And good for them because that's amazing. And they're there for a reason. And it's a partnership at the end of the day, genuine. But you're sacrificing your livelihood. You're, sa you're sacrificing your financial picture. And that th there's weight on that. Now, of, of course, you've got to understand how much leverage you have. But these are real financial decisions that have real impact on, on, your, on your livelihood. So uh, that's why I say, yes, it's a good analogy because you've got a color, but get creative about the coloring. <laughs> yep. Okay. Um, Vidiana. Vidi, Vidiana. Diana. I'm so sorry. I'm cutting everybody's name. Yeah. It's like when I'm sitting at the doctor's office or the VA, they come out and say, Angela Rene Burton. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so how do you handle, <laughs> how do you handle competition within your franchise territory? How do you handle competition? You sit next to them and you learn from them. <laughs> <laughs> and that's one of the things that they pointed out. Like, you have to have those communications. There's always that negative connotation about 
uh, competition. And I can tell you from personal experience, we've only been open for four months and already I saw two ice cream shops. They're opening a Starbucks, uh, which sells coffee, which we sell. They're opening a McDonald's, which sells ice cream, which we sell as well. Um, so there's always that negative connotation of uh, that the competition is going to obviously negatively affect your sales. Um, but pretty much what I always try to keep is the mentality that the sun shines for everybody. And competition is actually a good thing because it's going to bring more people uh, it's going to drive the market, and it also um, is, is an impulse for us as business owners to think outside the lines. Um, you study your competition, you know them, you learn from them, um, and also you find ways in which you can compete. Perhaps, like for example, from my personal experience, I can't compete with Dairy Queen as far as prices or numbers, but we can compete in customer service possibly. Or maybe we have to uh, change our marketing to kind of attract a different type of, of, uh, of individual to our, our store. So I think uh, the biggest thing that you can think of as far as competition is to see it as a positive thing because it, at the end of the day, the competition is what drives the, the market but it also drives you as a business owner to come up with creative ways in which you can drive those sales. Oh, love that. Hey. Anybody want to add to that? Or? She said it all. She's right? awesome. She left you speechless. She's awesome. No, I really think that uh, the, the thing that came to mind as I was hearing you talk is, is you know, and, and we all go through different stages, right, in your business. And, and I, what a great answer she had. I'm thinking, man, four months in, I'm focused on systems, routines, training, recruiting my team members. I'm not even thinking about competition yet, but that shows that she's done her homework and that she's ahead of the game and that she's looking at those things. And so that's really important, right? And, and when I've made a ton of mistakes, as we've made a lot of mistakes as well, you know, we try to keep it as raw and honest as possible. So something also you want to look at, there's something called a franchisee life cycle, right? Uh, you have franchisees and you look at the franchisee community, and I'm sure this happens in the hotel business as well, is, you know, where are they in their life cycle? Where's that franchisee group? Are they a bunch of go-getters like my partner here that's going to kick butt? Well, she's probably not going to sell her business anytime soon. She's going to go and flourish and build several units. Or are they not building any units and, and there's room for growth, right? Because the franchise model is a, a, um, a model for scale. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you all. Don't go get one franchise. You don't want that. Uh, there's a lot of great companies. You can go get a job somewhere else. Um, but if you're going to do franchising, you want to scale. And that's why I root for uh, Viridiana here to, to grow because that's what it's about. It's about that scalable model. So look at that franchisee cycle and see if there's room for scale and for growth. Um, and then look at um, the competitive set here locally and see who your neighboring operators are. But uh, I love that answer. That was awesome. Outstanding. Okay, Nitin. I'm going to give you, is it, I'm going to give him the last question. And then um, I'm just afraid we're going to run out of time and I want to be able to allow the um, audience to ask questions. So are we okay with that? You're good? All right. Okay. Um, how do you stay updated with industry trends and changes and how does, the, how does this influence your business decisions? Um, you know, we... we you see, it, it's very, it's very, uh, I guess, evolving in, in our industry. Uh, we, we listen a lot to our guests, obviously. I you know the last panel talked about reviews, and uh, we we get a lot of our pivot moments from our our guests and from our our line level uh, staff. So every quarter, we kind of have a, a powwow with, uh, with a, we have over 300 employees, so we invite about 20 employees and some of the employees half of them are before six months and some of them are another half are after six months and we kind of get an idea of what's happening in the hotels and what can we do better and then obviously we 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 go into different industries like bob like i'll, I'll talk to our competitors and i'll talk to um people that are not even in our industry and see what's working what's not working and and try to pivot but it's uh, it's basically like goes back to communication with your staff, your guests, and, and, and your, uh, your competitors. You just can't be scared. Some people are very scared to talk to the competitors, which that's, uh, 
It's not right. You think, you think talking to your competitors is healthy, and uh, and sitting next to them is even healthier. Yeah, I like that. Really, when you think about it, folks, it's all about relationships, right? It's how we manage our relationships, and it's how we network. And you know, some people have strengths in other things um, that we don't have strengths in, and, and leveraging that you know, is very important. And I, I see the camaraderie up here and I just really enjoy it. And um, I'm just very happy and proud to be um, the moderator today. Um, just, and then real quick, um, I want to recognize, oh, where'd she go? Maria. I was going to recognize Maria Juarez. She is the director of the Small Business Development Center here. And uh, they partner with the SBA on providing uh, counseling and technical assistance uh, to small businesses. I, I didn't, yeah, but she, she left. I don't know where she went. Anyway, can we give her Maria a hand? All right. All right, so we're ready. Does, any, does anybody have any questions that they want to ask any of the panelists? Okay. Yep, we're going to get a mic to you. Oh, wow, okay. Sure. Um, there's a lot of resources and there's a lot of communities. So there's a, there's a conference out of Las Vegas that's a multi-unit franchising conference. It's an excellent conference to go to. That You will see the, the side of the franchisor and the franchisee. Um, and so I think that you're going to have to have a um, deep understanding of your brand, a deep understanding of your systems and routines, and then you're going to have, have to have a very good legal team, right? Um, so something that's really important about scaling a business, um, in my opinion, um, is you need to have a strong company culture. If you don't have a strong company culture, that scale is going to happen, and then it's going to crumble. Um, and so that strong company culture, Nitin was just telling me about how strong some of the company cultures is, is in, in a restaurant concept that they've explored or been part of. And, and that's really, it's really integral. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll summarize it by saying have a very strong uh, company culture, understand your brand and, and your systems, and then have strong financial planning. Um, you really need to understand the financial plan and backwards engineer or reverse engineer the model that you're, tr you're hoping to achieve. Great answer. Great question. Who else? He's bringing the microphone if you want to. Okay, sing your question. Sing it. Um, it's not so much of a question. It's more of a comment. Um, Viriana has stated how other businesses and franchises are opening up and she was discussing about competition. I just wanted to say in a humorous manner, uh, don't worry about McDonald's, their ice cream machine's always broken. <laughs> but uh, on, a, on a more serious note, and I hope that it's a little bit more uplifting, I am a small business owner. I know there's, you know, um, franchises in here, we're all kind of mixed in, um, but we all have the same goal. Um, Every time I go down, you know, the, the bread aisle or, you know, any, any common aisle that we shop in at, at, you know, mom and pop stores or Walmart, Sam's Club, there's so many different brands. There's so many different companies. You know, there's so many different owners of different loaves of bread and everybody's buying them. So I, I, when I find myself getting discouraged because uh, I manufacture hot sauce, salsa, spices, you know, and, and sometimes I'm there and I have business cards and I'm looking at sauces myself. Um, I see somebody there and I'm like, oh, you know, I, I want this, I want that. I'm like, here you go. Seize that as an opportunity and, and, and promote yourself and get your name out there, even if it's a business card, an inquiry, or, you know, just discussing what you have available and, and the drive that you have and your creativity behind your marketing. Very good. Love that. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I'm gonna just give a quick plug for the SBA. We have a program called Thrive Emerging Leaders and I actually have a couple of graduates in here. We have, the application portal is open right now. 
Um, if you are a business that you've been in business at least a couple of years, you have one employee, um, and you're looking to create a three-year strategic plan, I'd love to have you in our cohort. The cohort is about five months long. Um, it is hybrid and uh, in-person. But if you're interested, please come see me because uh, the, co the uh, application is going to close soon. Um, but it's a, it's a great program, and I'd love to have some of you in that program. And there's Maria. See? We gave you a big hand. All right. Any other questions? Questions? The reporter. Uh-oh. This is off record. His name badge says press. This will be equal time for McDonald's with their ice cream machine problem, and that bothers me also very much. <laughs> <laughs> Angela, uh, I was in response to what you're talking about, getting the community involved in your Dairy Queens and your franchises, very important. Freshman through senior year, I worked first time off the farm with something other than driving a tractor. I'm working at the big freezer in Far San Juan Alamo, Rick Diaz, my classmate. So we were always looking for something different, tamales, knitting, or whatever. We're always playing with the menu. So fast forward, I'm handling the McDonald's franchise, three of them in Corpus Christi. And we needed, we were in trouble, losing money. So my, my answer is, we need to have a lettuce and tomato hamburger, which we did not. So next thing we're doing, we're working collaboration with Ray Kroc, and we put in the first lettuce and tomato hamburger anywhere in the world in a McDonald's. Huh. So I moved to Brownsville to build KDA, which is today KTEX. McDonald's having trouble at their Amigo Land Mall location. How about we have breakfast? So we put in breakfast. So you never know what kind of child is going to end up doing something because you pay attention to what they learned when they were young. Very important. And then what is this? Tamales? No, Leasi. So would, would either one of you, primarily Bob or Vidiana, consider, especially Vidiana, a item on your menu which has tequila, Ruby red grapefruit and ice cream. Vidiana, you got an answer? What do I you think? If you don't have that, you need it. I need it, right? So that's <laughs> Ron, a big don't part. pressure her too much, okay? <laughs> <laughs> that is uh, similar to what we know as a paloma. It's a tequila, grapefruit, and a little bit of ice cream. So oh, yeah. it's definitely something to incorporate and to have those conversations up in the leadership team with. Sounds like you need to go visit. Okay, I think that's it. Um, it's time, and I hear plates and stuff clinging, so we're eating. Um, again, follow us, SBA, on Twitter and LinkedIn, and um, we do have a webpage, uh, www.sba.gov. Please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or my staff. We are here to support you, and thank you so much. It was a wonderful crowd today.